say was, this lecture is being recorded. It will join all of our other lectures on our YouTube channel. And I wanted to say that here's some interesting news. The easiest way to access this lecture, as well as all of the other ones on YouTube, will be going to the new and improved, vastly improved um, WIS website. You can access the website by going to www.wedgwoodinternationalseminar.org. And as you can see on this slide, the website can be accessed on your smartphone, on your laptop, as well as on your desktop. And in addition to being able to connect to the WIS YouTube channel and to our Facebook page. When using the website, you will be able to learn more about WIS events, how to become a member, how to support the organization, Wedgwood News, and how to contact us. And further, there is a section on resources, which is uh, a list of books, and other ceramic circles, uh, so, sorry, other ceramic organizations. Of course, and here's the news you've all been waiting for, the information regarding the April seminar can be accessed via the website. Since our uh, Zoom lectures began last February, it has been our great pleasure to present these lectures to the public free of charge. If you're not already a WIS member, why not consider joining? Since in addition to the Zoom lectures, other benefits include the annual April four-day in-person seminar, the scholarly proceedings, which is edited by Dr. Ann forschler Tarish, and the fellowship of so many other ceramic enthusiasts from around the world. And as I mentioned, you can also go to the WIS new website in order to access a membership application. A few words about how we're going to conduct today's meeting. Anne will be the moderator. She will introduce our speaker, Miranda Goodby. Following that lecture, we'll have a time for a question and answer session and during the lecture, please remember to type your questions into the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. And after our Q&A session, I'll take a, a minute or two to give you more information about the next Zoom lecture, which will be in February and some other information. So please let me turn it over to Anne. Great. Thank you, Lorraine. You're welcome. I'm just gonna share my screen as well. All right. Well, Miranda, of course, for most of us needs no introduction. She is uh, the Senior Curator of Ceramics, of course, at the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery in Stoke. She studied the history of design and visual arts at Staffordshire University before she did graduate work at Manchester University. And she's worked in a variety of English museums, including the British Museum, but since 1995 has been in charge of the ceramics collections at the Potteries Museum. And there they have the largest collection of Staffordshire pottery in the world, more than 30,000 pieces from the 17th century to the present day. And she also uh, curates the collections of European, Asian, and Middle Eastern ceramics. So it's very large, lots of duties there. Miranda also has taught ceramic history at the undergraduate and graduate level. She speaks regularly here in the US and in the UK. She is um, a member of numerous societies and she has written for numerous publications ceramics journals about the field. She's especially interested in 18th and 19th century Staffordshire earthenwares and stonewares, which were the development of the Staffordshire industry from the 1750s onward, including Wedgwood. She's interested also uh, not only in the objects themselves, but in the lives of the pottery workers and in the social history surrounding the ceramics industry. 
In 2017, she led the successful fundraising campaign to acquire one of the surviving Wedgwood first days bases for the Pottery Museum in Stoke. So please welcome Miranda. Please, again, don't forget to mute yourselves. Following the lecture, we'll have a Q&A period. So please ask your questions in the chat. And now I will turn it over to Miranda. Thank you for being with us today, Miranda. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Excellent, good, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I'm delighted and honoured to um, be part of the uh, WIS um, Autumn and Winter Lecture Programme. It's uh, a real honour to be speaking to you this evening. Um, just a couple of things. Um, one, I think I'm going to be relying on you and to forward the slides because of a slight technical issue. So please forgive the fact I will be saying next slide, please, quite regularly. Um, there will be relatively few pieces of pottery in this lecture, um, which I hope you'll forgive me um, because I'm rather hoping that what I have to say um, will be of sufficient interest um, on its own. Um, could I have the first slide, please? Splendid, thank you. Um, Lorraine and I were both just mentioning about the, um, the Wedgwood First Days vase that we acquired in uh, 2017. And uh, I thought at least I could do is to put up a, an image of it. And just to thank all those people that I know contributed towards the public fundraising campaign that we had to keep that piece in, in Staffordshire. To start. Um, I think Josiah Wedgwood has had more written about him in the form of books and articles, both scholarly and popular, than any other 18th century potter. And we're fortunate that an enormous quantity of documentary material survives about the man and his work. And these range uh, from his extensive correspondence, including his letters to his business partner, Thomas Bentley, to his commonplace books, and as well his, as his business papers, uh, his oven books, his order books, his accounts, etc the hugely successful pottery factory. And these documents have been widely drawn upon by his biographers from Eliza Metyard onwards. And numerous extracts have been published over the years. And of course, each writer has selected and filtered from this information to help support the story that they wanted to tell about Wedgwood's life and career. And certain elements continually reoccur of which uh, two of the most popular are that uh, Josiah Wedgwood was unable to become uh, a thrower of pottery due to an attack of smallpox in his youth, uh, that he was unable to throw pottery on the wheel, and that he had little family support in becoming a master potter. And I hope to be able to show that neither of these things are, are true. Uh, as, as and instead, Josiah Wedgwood was a skilled and experienced thrower uh, who in 1769, at the opening of the Etruria factory, demonstrated this by throwing six first days vases, and who was also at the center of a supportive extended family. In the late 20th and early 21st century, new information has become available to researchers and historians. And this ranges from archeological excavations in and around Stoke-on-Trent, to the discovery and the analysis of additional 18th and early 19th century documents, which helped to provide additional context to Wedgwood's career and achievements. And could I have the next slide, please? My talk this evening draws heavily on uh, information in the Enoch Wood paper archive. Uh, this is an accumulation of original documents compiled by the pottery manufacturer Enoch Wood in the late 18th and early 19th century. And it also includes a memoir of his own childhood in the 1760s and 70s, which you can see uh, on the screen here with a few additional documents. The archive was purchased by the Potteries Museum in 2005 with the aid of the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Friends of the Potteries Museums, to whom we're both very grateful. Enoch Wood was a contemporary of Josiah Wedgwood. He knew Wedgwood personally, and his father, Aaron Wood, and his older brother, William Wood, both had first-hand and extensive experience of working for Josiah Wedgwood as modelers. Uh, next slide, please. 
Enoch Wood was an eminent Burslem master potter and antiquarian, known as the father of the potteries in his later life. And he compiled his memoirs in the 1820s and 30s towards the end of his life. Enoch had known Josiah Wedgwood from his earliest childhood, as well as many of Wedgwood's extended family. But included in his memoir are also accounts that he had written down of interviews that he'd had in the early 19th century with what he described as aged persons, many of whom had worked with or for Josiah Wedgwood in the mid 18th century. And what's significant about uh, Enoch Wood's memoir is that it's first hand information about Josiah Wedgwood from people that were there in the 1760s, 1770s, and 1780s. Now, some of these interviews with the aged persons were used in a shortened form by Simeon Shaw when he wrote his History of the Staffordshire Potters, which was published in 1829. But he left out a lot of the um, what he felt were minor details, but actually gives us a, some really interesting nuggets. Um, and so consequently, much of the information that was in the archive was lost to view until the early 21st century. Now, as Enoch's memoir largely covers only his childhood, my talk will not look at Wedgwood's entire career, only the period up to his move from Bursum to the new Etruria factory, and not including his partnership with Thomas Bentley, which has been widely written about. Next slide, please. Now, I realise that a lot of my text is going to be on the right hand side, so um, I shall try and uh, help uh, where it's uh, covered by the images um, as far as I possibly can. So this is a map of Burslem as it was around about 1750, and it was commissioned by Enoch Wood in 1816. Uh, if you look up here, you can just see uh, that's the date that it was um, drawn, it's a hand-drawn map, and it was based on, on the memories of various inhabitants of Burslem, with Enoch going and speaking to various uh, inhabitants who remembered the town as it had been in the middle of the 18th century, and it's heavily annotated, as you can see, all over with little inscriptions and so forth. And we'll see quite a lot of this map this evening. It's the earliest known map of, of the town. So in the mid 18th century, Burston was only a small place. As you can see, it was really more of a large village than anything else. Uh, it had only a few hundred inhabitants and its main industry was pottery making. But you can see it was surrounded by um, fields and it was very much an agricultural as well as an industrial uh, centre. The local people were connected not just by kinship ties, but also by their work, by apprenticeships that they served, by their employment, by partnerships, by who they rented their workshops from, by who owned, owed them money and who they owed money to. Next slide, please. Now, at this period, there were two important parts of the large Wedgwood clan. There were many Wedgwood families within Burslem, but it's quite hard to sort of narrow them down. But here we have the big house Wedgwoods, and that's their um, house seen at the bottom of the screen. And that was the largest brick built house uh, in 18th century Burslem, and it still stands today. And that was owned and, and the factory behind it was operated by the two brothers, John and Thomas Wedgwood, who were generally known as the Long Wedgwoods due to their height. And they lived there with their respective families in what was, as I say, then the largest and the best house in Bursa. The other um, branch of the Wedgwoods, the one to which Josiah Wedgwood belonged, was the Churchyard Wedgwoods. Uh, and their house and factory was adjacent to St John's Church on the edge of the town. And if you look very carefully, as I say, you can see just here, Josiah Wedgwood, born here, annotated. Josiah Wedgwood's older brother, Thomas, who ultimately owned two factories, the Churchyard Works and the larger Overhouse Works in the centre of Burslem, was generally known as Churchyard or Overhouse Wedgwood. Next slide, please. As we know, Josiah Wedgwood was born at the small churchyard works in Burslem in 1730, the youngest child of Thomas Wedgwood and his wife Mary. Josiah's father died when he was nine and his oldest brother, also named Thomas, there really does seem to have been a shortage of Christian names in 18th century Burslem, uh, took over running the family pottery at the churchyard. Thomas, senior and junior both made lead glazed earthenwares and 
some excavations on the site of the family's pottery has revealed buff coloured wares covered with mottled glazes typical of the period 1720 to 40, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. And this was typical of the period and of the type made by numerous other local potteries at this, at this time. In 1744, at the age of 14, uh, the young Josiah was apprenticed to his brother for five years to learn the art, mystery, occupation or employment of throwing and handling. Could I have the next slide, please? In 1816, Enoch Wood took down the testimony of John Fletcher, who was then 83 years old. That is, he was born in 1733 and was just three years younger than Josiah. And as you can see here, um, John Fletcher says he first began to work at the churchyard pot works for Josiah Wedgwood. He was hired to make balls for Josiah and Richard Wedgwood, both throwers, and he stood between them. One sat in each corner of a small room and he made balls for both at the same time. Next slide, please. He then left them as ball maker to turn the lathe for Moses Marsh, who turned the ware the two young Wedgwoods through. And so when Moses Marsh uh, stopped working as a baller, he went to work for a turner. And as you can see here, um, he would have been providing the motive power for the turner's lathe. You have these two uh, boards here and uh, the um, assistant would have, have literally just um, joggled those boards up and down all day long and that would have provided the power for the turner to um, refine the shape of the wares that have been thrown. Could we go on again please, next slide. John Fletcher went on to say, Richard Wedgwood did not like work and soon after became a private soldier, but Josiah was industrious and continued to throw as a journeyman. So here we have a first-hand account of someone who observed the young Josiah as a thrower. And how was this if Josiah was lame following an attack of smallpox in his youth? Well, by the 1730s, when Wedgwood was born, the standard potter's wheel used in Staffordshire was no longer the old-fashioned kick wheel, which was operated by the potter's foot. And that would indeed have been almost impossible for Josiah to use with his um, injured leg. Instead, the so-called great wheel was in use throughout the industry and indeed continued in use uh, up until the early part of the 20th century. And here the motive power was provided by another person and if you can see the uh, image at the bottom which is from uh, Angerstein's tour of Britain in the uh, from the 1760s, you can get an idea of perhaps more clearly of the mechanism. Um, at the bottom we have here the, the great wheel itself with its crank handle which is turned by somebody else and the rope attached to it then drives the, um, the potter's wheel. So you don't need to provide the power yourself. And could you go on to the next slide please? And this is an illustration from the 1840s which uh, lays it all quite clearly. You can see the baller in the background dividing up the great wedge of clay uh, ready for the thrower to uh, use it. This meant his work was quicker of course and uh, beside him his assistant uh, turning the wheel itself. The great wheel was a much faster and more efficient way of making pottery. The thrower could concentrate all his energies on shaping the ware while his assistant provided the energy to power the wheel and his output and therefore his earning potential was much greater. And of course this is what happened in 1769 when Wedgwood threw the first day vases, not something that could be done by somebody who wasn't already a skilled and experienced thrower of pots. Josiah sat comfortably to his work while poor Thomas Bentley worked up a sweat, turning the handle of the great wheel to Wedgwood's direction, now faster and now slower until all the vases were formed. But that was to be in the future of course. In the 1740s and 50s, Josiah was building up his skills as a practical potter and becoming increasingly skilled. Next slide, please. In, this is a, another view of that same little um, map of um, 18th century Burslem, and it shows here the overhouse works. Um, here is the house itself and the pottery attached to it, and it had all this land with it. It had been operated by uh, Josiah Wedgwood's older brother, Thomas, from the 1740s, um, but it actually became his own property 
1757. And this was uh, Josiah's oldest brother, of course, Thomas Wedgwood. And he inherited this pottery from his aunt. It was situated in the center of Burslem and um, was a much more important uh, pottery site than the little churchyard works. We know that Thomas Wedgwood had been operating this factory on behalf of his wealthy aunt, Catherine Edgerton, since at least 1742, as he was described as Thomas Wedgwood of the Overhouse when he married in that year. He also inherited his aunt's land and other properties, including coal mines. And Thomas Wedgwood became, as Enoch Wood said, a rich man at once and was looked up to as the richest gentleman in this parish. The Overhouse works made salt glazed stoneware, a different type of pottery from the lead glazed earthenwares that were being made at the churchyard works. And as the two factories were some distance from each other, Thomas Wedgwood and his young family moved out of the house beside the churchyard works to the Overhouse and its much um, more important factory. By 1749, shortly before Thomas uh, inherited this, but whilst he, Thomas was still working that factory, Josiah came out of his apprenticeship and he continued working as a journeyman for his brother. And he may even have acted as Thomas Wedgwood's on the spot foreman at the churchyard works when um, Thomas was uh, engaged at the Overhouse. According to Enoch Wood, Josiah also moved out of the family home at the churchyard and instead lodged with one of Thomas Wedgwood's employees, Daniel Greatbatch. And this was to be a hugely important relationship um, later on, and in fact, for, for much of Josiah's working career. It was at this period, while still living in Burstam and working for his brother, that Josiah started making pottery on his own account, albeit in a very small way. According to Enoch Wood's memoir, next slide please, Daniel Greatbatch, being a good workman, Josiah employed him to make toys and had them fired a sagger full or two in his brother Thomas's oven and sold them at high prices. Toys was the contemporary term for small wares or, or fancies as they were later to be called, um, such as figures and small ornamental decorative pieces. Now, although this may seem rather strange practice that um, Josiah was commissioning Daniel to make these wares and then firing them in his older brother's oven, it, it was commonplace at the time. If a potter had uh, not made enough wares themselves to fill their, their oven for firing, rather than firing it partly empty, which would have been very inefficient, the potters would agree to fire other men's wares for a small charge. It was also common for working potters such as Daniel, if they had completed their allotted work for their main employer, to do additional work on the side for whoever wanted their skills. And this seems to have been the arrangement between the Wedgwood brothers. Once Daniel Greatbatch had finished his week's work for Thomas Wedgwood, Josiah employed Daniel to press small moulded wares on his behalf and had them fired in his brother's oven. The relationship between Daniel Greatbatch and Josiah was to be a long-standing one. Not only was Daniel to be one of his first employees when Wedgwood opened his own factory in Burston in 1759, but according to Enoch Wood, Daniel then became Josiah's rep uh, first representative in Liverpool before Wedgwood's own friendship with Bentley. And he was later to become one of the foremen at the ornamental works during the Wedgwood and Bentley partnership. And he was still employing uh, one of the Wedgwood houses near the factory at Etruria in 1797. In the early 1750s, Josiah moved a few miles away to take up a partnership in the nearby village of Stoke-upon-Trent. And traditionally, it's been said that he was forced to do so as his brother Thomas would not take him into partnership, being unimpressed by Josiah's desire to experiment with improvements to pottery design. But there is another way, perhaps, of interpreting this information. Thomas Wedgwood was a married man with a young and increasing family. He hoped to inherit the overhouse works, and as of course he did, but at the present he only owned the churchyard works. This is in the early 1750s. Thomas Wedgwood's first duty was to his children. As they grew up, they would be apprenticed, and in due course, his eldest son would inherit the pottery factory. Any younger sons would be expected to make their own way in the world by using their family connections. For Thomas to take his youngest brother into partnership, overlooking the two brothers that lay between them, would mean that his business would have to support two families, his own 
and Josiah's future family. As far as Thomas was concerned, his business had to, not only to provide a future livelihood for his eldest son, but also dowries and legacies for the rest of his children. And this, of course, was exactly what had happened to Thomas himself. As the oldest son, he had inherited his father's property works at the churchyard, and there were legacies for the other children. And then again, because he was the eldest son in the family, he inherited all his aunt's property. So instead of taking his youngest brother into partnership, the, he called on family relationships. Family connections came into play, and Josiah went into partnership with John Harrison, a relation by marriage. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So what Enoch Wood says is that, oh dear, we've got uh, slightly over the text there, for which apologies. Um, then Josiah went to Stoke and became partner in a pottery on Cliffgate Stoke um, with Mr. Harrison of Newcastle, who embanked 800 pounds in the making of greenwares, melons, agate, and so forth. And um, you'll have to take my word for it, that um, the quote then goes on to say that uh, he was supplying people with all sorts of wares during this partnership, including knife hafts, um, and forks and all kinds of wares, including um, agate, uh, marble and other kinds. I'm going to go on to the next slide um, in that case. As a first partnership for a young man of 22, it wasn't a bad move. And Josiah now had a chance to prove himself without being in his brother's shadow. His new partner was not a trained potter himself. Uh, Mr. Harrison uh, was the son of a successful local shoemaker who wanted to invest in the pottery. So it was Josiah who was the practical partner in the business. And Enoch Wood goes on to say uh, that Mr. Josiah Wedgwood of the churchyard, uh, after he broke a partnership with Mr. Harrison, whom it was said he had nearly been ruined by Josiah's experiments at making greenware, tortoiseshell, agate, etc., went into partnership with Wilden who by this time had grown rich and soon left off business. And as we know, uh, within a couple of years of the partnership um, with Harrison in Stoke, uh, Josiah moved on to a, a better and more important partnership in a highly successful and well-established business. His new partner, Thomas Wielden, was looking for someone to take over much of the practical running of his own business now that he was getting older and getting to be very wealthy and not really wanting to be so involved on the day-to-day -day work. So in 1754, Josiah was taken on as the managing partner of Wilden's factory at Fenton. And it was here that he started methodically to record his experiments in improving bodies and glazes. And um, the blue circle here is uh, Burslem, where uh, Wedgwood starts out. He then moved to Stoke, to um, the little factory here um, at Cliffbank in Stoke, before moving on to Little Fenton, where uh, Wilden's factory was. He then, of course, moves back to Burslem and ultimately uh, builds his own works here at Etruria in the late 16, uh, 1760s. Uh, this is Yeats's map of Staffordshire from 1775, which was after the Trent and Mersey Canal had been built, and you can see it running up through the map here. But of course, in the 1750s, that was long before the Trent and Mersey Canal had been built. It was whilst in partnership with um, Thomas Wielden, that Josiah was to meet William Greatbatch, who at that time was an apprentice to Wielden. William Greatbatch was the younger brother of Daniel Greatbatch, with whom Wedgwood had worked at Burslem. The young William was a skilled modeler and in due course was himself to be a successful master potter. Also working for Thomas Wielden in the mid 1750s was the experienced modeler and block maker Aaron Wood, father of Enoch Wood. And could you have the next slide, please? In writing about his travels around Stoke-on-Trent with his father as a child in the 1760s, Enoch Wood recalled, On our passing by the place at Little Fenton, where Mr. Wielden and Wedgwood formerly occupied as manufacturers, my father repeatedly pointed out the place he had formerly worked in and said he was always locked up while he made the models and moulds for Wielden, which consisted of knife hafts and cabbage and other leaves for dessert sets, crab stock handles and cabbage leaf spouts, for teapots, coffee pots, chocolate cups, candlesticks, etc. I think in, in reading um, you know, Ward's memoirs, he doesn't mean that he was locked in by uh, Wielden. I think what he means is that um, Aaron Wood was locking out anybody else that might have been inclined to see his working methods. 
Uh, these are two pieces in our collection. They're, they're not uh, marked, of course, um, but the lower one certainly matches uh, shards that were found on the Wealdon site in the uh, 1960s and 70s. And the top one is just a very nice cauliflower teapot. Could you have the next slide, please? By 1759, Josiah Wedgwood was 29 years old and had at least 15 years of practical experience of pottery making. He felt confident enough to venture into business on his own, and he left Thomas Wilden's works at Fenton and moved back to his hometown of Burslem. And there he agreed to rent a small factory in Shoe Lane, right in the centre of Burslem, from two of his older cousins, Long John and Thomas Wedgwood of the Big House Works, for £15 per annum. And this just shows uh, the little factory itself uh, right in the centre of the town. And as you can see, within a very short distance of his brother's uh, much more important works. Could I have the next slide, please? So he's renting the um, factory in Shoe Lane for £15 per year. Um, John and Thomas Wedgwood's of the Big House's rent book for 1759 survives, and it shows that Josiah did not merely rent the works, but also bought from his cousins a thrower's wheel at one pound and eight shillings. And hopefully, if you can just click on that, and we'll get that highlighted. Yes, no. Yes, there we go. Uh, so you can see there two wheel, one pound eight shillings, and two flagstone, 18 shillings. Um, so there's some improvements to the flooring, as well as buying in some of the expensive equipment that Wedgwood is going to need. Um, and could you have another uh, click on that for another section of the uh, text, if we're lucky? And as anybody who's ever had building work done at home, you'll sympathise with this one, because they, the um, cousins knocked two pounds off Wedgwood's uh, rent in the first year by allowance from the building not being finished. Builders don't change even over 250 years. Again, drawing on his family connections, Josiah contacted one of his numerous cousins, yet another Thomas Wedgwood, who had also been apprenticed at the churchyard works alongside Josiah. And this Thomas Wedgwood was then working as a potter in Worcester. In late 1758, Josiah asked him to come and work for him in his new business that was due to open in May 1759. This Thomas Wedgwood was to become integral to the success of Josiah's business, and to distinguish him from the various other Thomas Wedgwoods in Burslem, is generally referred to as useful Thomas Wedgwood. And Josiah eventually took him into partnership in 1766. Now, all Josiah needed was workers and customers. With regard to the customers, there were plenty to be found on his doorstep. As well as the wholesale and retail customers that Josiah could find for himself, there was also a long established tradition of pottery manufacturers buying in wares from other makers goods that they could not supply themselves. And if I could just ask you just to click again, if you'd be so kind, Anne. And as you can see in that first year of business, part of the rent of his factory um, to his cousins was paid to them, not in cash, but by goods. So Josiah Wedgwood was making wares that he was then supplying to his cousins in lieu of cash towards the rent. And it was valued at four pounds, 10 shillings. Josiah, of course, wasn't relying on other potters in Stoke-on-Trent to, um, to buy his wares exclusively. You really can't make money that way if they're all buying in wares from each other exclusively. But of course, don't forget, he also had the details of Wilden's customers with whom he had been dealing for several years. And in addition, uh, one of Josiah's other older brothers, John Wedgwood, was a successful merchant in London and acted as Wedgwood's, Wedgwood's agent for him there. And if you could have the next slide, please. As for workers, there were plenty of skilled workmen and women in Burslem. We're fortunate that Enoch Wood knew several of them and details them in his memoir. In, seven, in 1834, the old potter, uh, with the wonderful name of Careless uh, Simpson, which is, um, I think, um, spelling the name as it sounds, I think he's actually called Carlos Simpson, which is still pretty exotic for Burslem in the uh, 18th century. Anyway, dear old Careless Simpson, um, gave Enoch Wood information about Josiah's early career as an independent potter. And uh, he calls on um, Enoch in 1834 saying, I am this morning at four o'clock, eight years old. And Enoch gave him his dinner 
and some flannel to keep him warm in the approaching season. So some good warm cloth that he could make a waistcoat or whatever. Out of. And he's, he says, that is Carla Simpson says, old Thomas Jones was the fireman for Josiah Wedgwood when he began to make toys and knife hafts and pickle dishes, etc., in that pot work of Long John and Thomas Wedgwood at Shoe Lane. And this is a 19th century engraving of the factory. Uh, perhaps not strictly accurate, but as close as we can get. Uh, could we go on to the next slide, please? And Daniel Greybatch was his potter and made his moulds and pressed his toy dishes and things on them, such as chickens, joints of meat, and pies, etc. Now, I'm sorry to say that those little dishes at the top are not in our collection, but those are the sorts of things that um, it's being referred to. Uh, the pieces at the bottom are in our collection. Daniel Greatbatch married Thomas Jones's daughter, Nancy, and Careless Simpson married Hannah, Jones's youngest daughter, and the other daughter, Jenny, was married to Ralph Rowley, and all of them were employed by Josiah Wedgwood at Poise and Cauliflower and Melon Wares, etc. And I think you can see that from about 1752, uh, certainly up to 1769, uh, 1759, 1760, the sorts of wares that um, Josiah is making um, in his two partnerships and independently for himself are falling within that same range of wares, ones that he knew would sell well, which there was a ready market, whilst he's building up his capital to um, develop those wares further. Now to make these wares, the cauliflowers and the melon and all the others, any other moulded wares, what were needed were good models and moulds. And we know that Wedgwood had access to the skills of two good modellers who could produce the models for his wares. One was Aaron Wood, who by 1759, when Enoch Wood was born, had also moved back to Burslem. Uh, and could we have the next slide, please? And Aaron Wood's workshop was only a few yards away from the Ivy House. And Enoch Wood records that, I was born in a small and comfortable thatched house in the Rotten Row in um, in Burslem. And this is the property that he is referring to. This is a map of about, uh, based on 1750, of course, Enoch Wood was born in 1759. It had, the year before I was born, been converted into a dwelling house from a mottled ware manufactory with its sun pans, etc., before it as far as the large stew pond. And it soon became a comfortable residence with a good small garden. And so this is Enoch Wood's childhood home. Here is the stew pond. And all of this land was uh, converted from the old factory into um, Wood's uh, workshop. And if we could have the next slide, please. At that time, my father had his workshop in a small parlour of this house. And by his own industry alone, he gained six guineas per week for a considerable space of time by block cutting, as he termed his trade. And most unusually, we have a mid 18th century portrait of a skilled artisan, a skilled workman, not a pottery manufacturer, uh, not a member of the landed gentry, but a, a, a man of the middling sort. Uh, and this is a portrait of Aaron Wood, uh, painted by his brother in law, William Caddick, uh, who was a painter based in Liverpool. It's a very rare survival, it's actually in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. And we could have the next slide, please. At this period, the white stone earthenware or salt glazed earthenware had arrived at its greatest perfection and every master potter or master manufacturer in Staffordshire came to him to order their blocks, which then chiefly consisted of different patterns uh, in complete table services, dessert services, tall candlesticks, etc., of barley corn and barley corn and basket work, gadroon and mosaic and basket patterns, and lastly of a very good pattern called Dresden pattern. The two pieces you see here um, were both um, designed by Aaron Wood. The one on the top um, has a later inscription added to it uh, by Enoch Wood, and it reads, this dish was modeled by Aaron Wood around the year 1760 and was deposited in this building, AD 1835, by his son, Enoch Wood. And that was buried in the foundations of the Market Hall in Burslem, which was actually built on top of um, Josiah Wedgwood's Ivy House work. The one at the bottom, um, the, both of these pieces are in our museum, and the one at the bottom was given to us um, by um, Enoch Wood in the 1830s with the note that this piece had been um, modelled by his father. And if we go on to the next uh, pattern, the next page, please. 
From 1762, Josiah Wedgwood, who had moved to the larger Brick House Works, was also drawing on the talents of William Greatbatch. And this is the Brick Works. Uh, there's the little Ivy House Works. And down here is the Brick Works. Uh, it was demolished in the 19th century and the Wedgwood Memorial Institute um, put on top of it, effectively destroying any archaeology that there might have been. Um, Josiah had known uh, Great Batch since um, he was an apprentice with Thomas Wilden, of course. And by 1762, Great Batch had set himself up as an independent manufacturer uh, close to Thomas Wilden's factory. And as well as making wares on his own account, he was also supplying Wedgwood with moulds for Wedgwood's use and supplying Josiah with unglazed wares made at Great Batch's factory for Josiah to um, decorate and glaze. And the correspondence between William Great Batch and Josiah from the period 1762 to 1765 about the goods that Great Batch was supplying survives in the Wedgwood Museum archives and is quoted in full in David Barker's book, William Great Batch of Staffordshire, Staffordshire Potter. Unfortunately, of course, at this period, Wedgwood was not marking his wares, uh, certainly not consistently. And as I say, uh, the chances of any archaeology on the site are, are very uh, slight indeed as a result of there being a basement to the Wedgwood Memorial Institute. Um, so identifying which pieces uh, are of the cauliflower and melon wares and so forth are being made here um, is very difficult. Um, could you have the next slide, please? One survivor from this period, however, and here is uh, again a couple of 19th century illustrations of the brick house works. Uh, but one survivor from this period is the horn that you see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, which was presented to the Wedgwood Memorial Institute in 1887 and has a, a plaque. Um, uh, on the middle, um, on the chain around it, um, and that plaque reads, this horn was used to call together the work people of the great Josiah Wedgwood before the bell was instituted. And, um, apparently it was um, given or presented to a, a member of um, um, the family who gave it to the Wedgwood Institute, who had actually worked for Wedgwood at the time. So presumably when he moved uh, onto installing the bell, um, that became redundant and it was acquired by somebody and they, tre they treasured it as a, as a relic of the great Wedgwood. Um, Wedgwood bis um, Wedgwood's business flourished. His older brother, John Wedgwood, the successful merchant in Cateaton Street in London, was acting as his agent. He was taking orders. He was sourcing materials for enamel colours and gilding as Wedgwood expanded the range of wares he was making. He obtained, obtained prints to be adapted for uh, decorating creamware. And as we know, he famously called on the young Queen Charlotte for examples of Wedgwood's creamware in 1765, uh, leading to Josiah being able to call himself Potter to Her Majesty. Enoch Wood himself was a child during um, Josiah Wedgwood's years at the Ivy House and then at the Brick House works. But at this period, uh, both his father Aaron and his older brother William Wood were both working for Josiah Wedgwood. For much of the 1760s, um, Enoch um, was also uh, playing with the children of Thomas Wedgwood of the Churchyard Works, who'd now moved his family to the Overhouse. Um, and he paints an idyllic picture in his memoir of running freely in and out of the various Wedgwood family factories and houses with the other boys uh, of his age, of the various Wedgwood families. And by the sound of it, getting under everyone's feet and observing all that was going on. And if we may have the next slide, that would be great. So here we are, here is Enoch Wood's house here by the stew pond and he just had to run across the fields to the overhouse works. And he says, my early part of life was spent as comfortably and happy as any of my companions of my age. The two sons of Mr Thomas Wedgwood of the overhouse were both a little older than myself and I generally spent much or most of my time at the overhouse, there being a large orchard well stocked with all kinds of fruit trees and barns and haylofts horses, dogs, pigeons, rabbits, turkeys, geese and ducks, large pools of water, fishing ponds and everything amusing for youth. Which is a rather nice image of a sort of 18th century childhood. And you can see here the, the orchard and the pond where they would have gone uh, fishing. At the age of seven, he also uh, was there when there was the formal cutting of the first stage of the Great Trenton Mersey Canal, and that was in 1766. And it was, um, being there was something that he recalled with great pride 
um, when the 50th anniversary of the cutting of the canal was celebrated with a, a formal dinner in 1816. And he stands up and makes this big speech saying how he was there with everybody else. And you know, he's obviously running in and around of everybody's legs. So at the age of seven, he wouldn't have been an important participant of this. Um, even though he was the guest of honour in 1816, one of the few people who were still alive who remembered that event. Anyhow, to go back to the um, 1760s. Um, like most children of the period, Enoch Wood was expected to make himself useful even before he was formally apprenticed, 14 uh, in 1773. Sorry. He had some schooling in Burslem. He made himself useful by turning the wheel for another brother, Aaron, who was a thrower. And he was sent for a short period to Liverpool to study drawing with his uncle, John Caddick, who did the portrait of Aaron Wood. He also uh, assisted his father, both in preparing plaster of Paris of which moulds were made and in helping to deliver to different factories in the district. So it wasn't all playing with the sons of Thomas Wedgwood at the Overhouse. He was expected to make himself generally useful so that when he took on an apprentice at the age of 14, he knew his way around a factory. He would have been aware of various um, skills that were needed. He'd have been sent on messages. He would have been going and fetching stuff. Um, when he started at 14, he would have been a useful person around the factory. Um, and if we may go on to the next slide, in the margins of his own copy of uh, Pitt's uh, A History of Staffordshire, which was published in 1817, and which is now in the Stoke-on-Trent City Archives, Enoch also wrote about going with his father to work at Josiah Wedgwood's Brick House Works in the late 1760s. Following Wedgwood's successful completion of the famous caudal service for Queen Charlotte, other orders, of course, followed from the royal family. And in one instance, um, Josiah had received orders from George III and Queen Charlotte for two creamware dinner services. And Enoch's father was called on by Wedgwood to produce new moulds adapted from a popular barleycorn pattern. Firstly, by removing the barleycorns, leaving only the divisions to create the queen shape, and then removing the divisions themselves to create the king shape. Um, and Enoch says, cream coloured ware, as was afterwards named from its yellow appearance by the inhabitants of Burslem, was generally made by the manufacturers. And this vase in our collection is an early um, unmarked piece of Wedgwood, but it is uh, attributed very firmly to him. Mr. Josiah Wedgwood sold some pieces of it to the Queen, which she admired, and ordered a table set to be made for her, after which it was called Queensware. The forms for this dinner service were shown to her in white stone or salt glaze for her to make a choice of pattern or form. Could you just have the next slide, please? She made choice of a set which my father, Aaron Wood, had last modelled for the potters called barleycorn pattern. I, I should perhaps point out that the random um, capitalisation, spelling and so forth is all Enoch's, by the way. Um, but the Queen wished to have the barleycorn taken out and to be left plain, which was done. And I helped to scrape some of it off the pieces. And this was afterwards called Queen's pattern. And you can see two plates down at the bottom there of that shape. Um, and of course, it's a, a shape that continues to be uh, made well into the 20th century and, and, and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. After this, the king ordered a service, but wished it to have it still more smooth and plain. My father and brother William then cut off the partitions which were left, which had divided the barley corn into compartments, and this was then called the royal pattern. And so there can be no confusion. Enoch very kindly um, does a little drawing at the bottom of the page. So here you have the shape of the plate with its barley corns, and here you can see the barley corns have been scraped off, just leaving the divisions between, and this is the queen shape, and here the um, divisions which divide it into panels have been taken off, and this is the king's or royal pattern shape. So as you can see at this period, young Enoch was coming and going freely at the bell works, helping his father and observing all that went on. He was obviously one of those noticing children. Um, and again, if we can go to the next slide. In his memoirs, he mentions an incident from 1767, where he says, I well remember at the time Mr. Cox brought an engine lathe from Birmingham to the bell works in Burslem and put it up in a chamber there over my father's modelling shop to teach James Horne and Abraham Smith to turn back teapots upon it. Next slide, please. As soon as this was accomplished, it was thought a most wonderful event. And uh, it, 
and as you can see here in the 1940s, uh, the engine lathe was still attracting visitors' attention. I can't find an illustration from the 18th century, but in the, this is from 1941. You can see what was essentially the same um, piece of machinery um, uh, still being used at the, uh, the Etruria factory at that point. So I, I, as soon as it was accomplished, it was thought a most wonderful event, and it brought um, old Mr. John Shrigley and Thomas Wedgwood, that's Thomas Wedgwood of the Overhouse, both great and rich potters, whiteware potters, that's his salt glaze potters at that time, to see the operation, but without asking leave of Josiah Wedgwood to see it. This so offended Josiah when Cox told him of it, that he ordered Cox to shut the door against them next time they came. Next slide, please. So Mr. Cox refused to let them see the lathes at work. And as Thomas Wedgwood was passing out of the door, Mr. Cox clapped the door upon Mr. T.W.'s coat lap and tore it. This and the refusal so offended the elder rich brother that it was long before the affront was forgiven, if ever. For I well remember that he, Thomas Wedgwood, was never seen there again. And I always observed a shyness between the brothers and the families did not associate. I never saw them together again after it. And I remember my father to say how much Thomas Wedgwood was offended at it. Oh, how these family disputes arise and go on for years afterwards over something quite small and simple. People don't change. <laughs> But you can sympathise with uh, Josiah Wedgwood. The image here, by the way, is Don Carp the late Dar Don Carpentier's engine lathe, which he created uh, for work at uh, Eastfield uh, to do his own engine turning on. But one can sympathise with Josiah Wedgwood. There he is, trying hard to improve his wares, investing in expensive new technology, and trying to get his employees to work more consistently and efficiently. And the whole of Burslem, from his brother downwards, is dropping in to see the new developments, stop his workmen from making progress, and doubtless trying to see what ideas they could copy. It's no wonder that technical developments in the pottery industry in 18th century Staffordshire could not be kept secret. But I do like the image of Thomas Wedgwood's coat being caught in the door and a long-standing family row arising from that incident. Enoch did not follow his brother William into Wedgwood's factory formally. Instead, in the early um, 1770s, he was apprenticed to one of Josiah's rivals, Humphrey Palmer, whose factory was in nearby Hamley, just over Minerwin. But his brother continued to work there with Wedgwood. And we have another view of Josiah from instance that Enoch recorded about his brother's working relationship with Josiah. William Wood, Enoch's older brother, worked for Josiah from the 1760s until his death in 1808. And like his father, Aaron, and his uncle, Ralph Wood, who are not really mentioned here, uh, he too was a modeler of useful wares, especially table wares. And could we have the next slide, please? And according to Enoch, William Wood, at 25 years of age, possessed superior abilities as a modeler of tableware to any man then living, and was the principal modeler of most of those beautiful forms of the useful and elegant table services which Mr. Wedgwood obtained the highest and most distinguished character of opening to the tables of nearly all the sovereigns in every quarter of the world. He was one of the most valuable men that Josiah Wedgwood ever had in his employ. And very little record of the wares that William modelled for Wedgwood has survived because obviously he wasn't marking them. Um, in Wedgwood's letters of 1767 and 1772, he mentions that William Wood was modelling uh, covered dishes for Lady Torrington and also some knife hafts. And Enoch himself owned this royal shaped dish of his brother's modelling, which is now in the Wedgwood Museum at Barlaston. Um, the Wedgwood historian Robin Riley believed that William Wood had also helped in modelling the fog service and he was certainly involved in the modelling of the Portland vase. And what's fascinating about this dish is that, um, as with the um, dish uh, made by um, Wood, uh, Enoch put a, a later inscription on it in red enamel. And I, I won't read it all to you, it's, it's, well, it's quite technical about improvements in the technique of pottery making. But the essential part is this dish was made at Atitruria by Messrs Wedgwood and Bentley the first year after they removed from Bursum to Etruria, and is my brother William's modelling. And he's written that, uh, here's his Enoch's signature at the bottom, and he's dated to 1826. I don't know how it went from Enoch's um, um, ownership to the Wedgwood collection, um, but um, Enoch 
had a habit of um, either donating uh, pieces uh, from his collection to museums or burying them as um, time capsules under bu buildings in Burslem. Enoch's comments that my brother William has lived private and little known are certainly true. And it is clear that Enoch wanted to record the contribution that he felt that William had made to Josiah Wedgwood's success, especially since, according to Enoch, Mr. Wedgwood was a thrower by trade and knew little of the other branches modeling or drawing. And this comment ties in quite nicely with Wedgwood's own comments that without his wife's taste, he would have made, and I quote, a poor figure amongst my pots, not one of which of any consequence is finished without the approbation of my Sally. Could you have the next slide, please? To show his brother's contribution, Enoch offered some notes given to him by William about his apprenticeship, um, in which William said, after having served two years in part of an apprenticeship to Mr. John Mitchell to learn the art of flowerer and handlerer, my father and Mr. John Mitchell agreed to make void the indentures, and at Martin Mass 1762, at my age of about 16 years, my father bound to me apprentice for five years more to Josiah Wedgwood to learn pressing and handling, and here we see uh, pressing of flatwares, ta uh, table plates, and so forth. However, at the end of my fourth year's apprenticeship, my father, Mr. Wedgwood, and myself agreed I should serve four years longer as modeler. At the weekly wages of four shillings a first, five shillings a second, and six shillings a third, six and six a fourth years, and ten and six, so as a, a, a weekly wages, and ten and six per annum for earnest, which was a, a sort of a, um, a little gift that was made. It was, it was in earnest. But at the end of the last two years and a half, my bountiful master gave me eight shillings per week and now and then half a guinea as a present. So he's getting eight shillings a week and now and then um, a bonus of 10 shillings. That's really unusual that you've got somebody do, undertaking three separate apprenticeships from the age of 14 and in the end serving, um, <laughs> well, four, four and two. So that's nearly 10 years apprenticeship. It's quite remarkable. Uh, Enoch goes on, however, to explain why William had such a protracted and disjointed apprenticeship. And if we could have the next slide, please. My brother William, being lame in the leg and very infirm when young, was the cause of my father putting him to an apprentice to, to flowering, which was then performed by women. And that was essentially, as you can see here, the um, incising of decoration uh, on, on salt glaze wares, which there was a huge demand. It was very, very popular. Um, so, but it was normally done by women. Uh, this, however, gave him, William, a taste for drawing in a more graceful manner than common, and of course prepared him to learn the lines of beauty and grace, which attracted the notice of all who happened to be better judges than those who bought this kind of ornament, ornamenting of that kind of earthenware. So this was cheap uh, ware, um, but William was much more skilled than that. And if we go on again to the next slide. He then goes on to tell us uh, something of how William was paid and reveals yet another way that trade secrets became more widely known. In the year 1775, my brother felt his value to the manufactory, that's Josiah's factory, of course, and well knowing Mr. Wedgwood's small ability to direct him in matters of taste and forms of tureens and tableware, he became restive sometimes. Next slide, please. He had then lately agreed with Mr. Wedgwood to charge his modelling at a price for each piece and not by weekly wages as usual. He had a good formed tureen and cover, nearly finished, but Mr. Wedgwood required an alteration made in its form, which my brother said would spoil it. Wedgwood still insisted on it being done, but afterwards allowed him to finish it in his own form, so he agreed that William Wood was right. On Saturday, William sent in his note, stating his charge for the week's work, and at the bottom, perhaps petulantly, wrote, so much for working backward and forward, i.e. wasting his time. If we have the next slide, please, and we'll see what happened next. This so offended Mr. Wedgwood that they agreed to part. My brother then joined my father in working for the public. Aaron Wood was a freelance uh, modeler and Aaron, William Wood went to join him. This hurt Mr. Wedgwood's mind and immediately threw his forms into the hands of Wedgwood's opponents in trade, so that in um, little more than 12 months, he made such offers and inducements for him to return that he could not refuse it. So William Wood goes off to work for Aaron and he has all his knowledge of his forms and shapes. So 
this probably explains why you look at a piece and if it's not marked, you can't be necessarily sure who made it. Mr. Wood, Mr. Wedgwood, sorry, um, promised him uh, a house. Sorry, I've lost my point. He promised him a house in any part of his manufacturing and a pony to ride out upon when he wanted exercise and air and such wages as though then small satisfied him as long as he lived. And this is a, an image of a diorama that we have in the museum showing the uh, factory at Atatruria beside the canal with the factory buildings here and just along here with their gardens behind them are the houses that Wedgwood built uh, to form Etruria village and which were largely let out to uh, the workforce at the Etruria factory. And of course this house would have been rent free. So he gets a nice little house close to the factory with a good sized garden and um, that's to, um, in addition to his wages. And the offer of a house as an addition to part of a valued employee's wages was, was common at the time uh, with Wedgwood. Uh, William Greatbatch, the modeler, uh, was, who was later to be uh, Jewett's works manager of Detroit, was offered a house and coals as part of his wages. So the house and his fuel bills were paid, uh, as was Hamlet Wood, Wedgwood's factory clerk. And the offer of a pony to ride out upon when wanted was of course the 18th century equivalent of a company car. It had all the benefit without the cost of actually maintaining a horse and paying its vet's bills and feed and so forth. The two quotes regarding the engine lathe and the modeling of a tureen throw quite a different light onto Josiah Wedgwood's character and I think make him much more three-dimensional. The man himself springs off the pages of his letters to Thomas Bentley and others but those are of course written by himself and I quite like this other view of Wedgwood, a Wedgwood who can be short-tempered and hasty. By the end of the 18th century the relationship between the Wood and the Wedgwood families had shifted. Though William Wood worked for Josiah until his death, Enoch, like Josiah before him, had become a highly successful manufacturer in his own right by the late, his late. And rather to his own surprise, find the overhouse works of Thomas Wedgwood, where he played so often as a young child. Next slide, please. There we go. So here we are back with the overhouse. Um, and now, highly as I and the whole town thought of the riches and superiority of the upper house or overhouse Wedgwoods at that time, none could have believed that such a change could take place in a few years as that I should become the master and only governor of the whole of the upper house, gardens, pot works, and the greatest uh, of gardens and pot works. Enoch's business continued to flourish and he eventually built himself a new factory at the Fountain Place. He became very he was also interested in the history of the local pottery industry. And he collected examples of pottery and documents relating to the history of his hometown, and many of those documents are, are now in, in the Potteries Museum in Stoke-on-Trent. And he also took down accounts of the pottery industry in the mid 18th century from old potters, what we would now call all testimonies, and by the end of his life was widely regarded as the historian of the industry and was generally referred to as the father of the potteries. He could now take his place beside Josiah Wedgwood, as far as status was concerned. Josiah, of course, had died in 1795, and, and Enoch Wood was to be hugely successful throughout the uh, early part of the 19th century. But despite this, he was clearly irritated by the adulation that was already being meted out to Josiah in the early 19th century. And could I have the next slide, please? Um, he says here, uh, cream colour was made by various persons in various articles long before it had the name of cream colour. And these are some early pieces in our collection of a cream coloured body, but with a tortoiseshell uh, sponging under the glaze. Creamware didn't spring from nowhere, of course. I have often been astonished to hear so many persons claim the honour of being the first who made cream coloured ware. However, while the potters were disputing the point on the ale benches at home, Mr. Wedgwood got acquainted with Mr. Bentley, who introduced him to literary characters and men of genius and who puffed away in handbills and newspapers in London, Germany and Russia and made the world believe all the merit was due to him. Next slide, please. And this is a piece in our collections again. He was very soon patronised also by Lord Gower, who was the uh, local aristocrat uh, based at Trenton Hall who brought all his visitors to Burslem to see these new articles which had been so recently described and published in the public papers. 
uh, by Mr. Bentley, who has now become a partner with Wedgwood and managed the warehouse himself in London, as well as found useful and valuable acquaintance with Sir William Hamilton and other antiquarians and ingenious men, all of whom contributed their assistance by supplying not only drawings and prints from Italy, but by supplying him with real vases, busts, etc., found in Pompeii and Herculaneum and other ancient places of fame. Enoch clearly felt that not enough credit was being given to the many people who had contributed to Wedgwood's success and put this down to him employing the most ingenious men that were at this date dispersed in every part of the Staffordshire properties. He definitely felt that Wedgwood was not the, um, the great man all on his own but was supported by his connections and his employees and in particular he felt that his contribution made by William Wood had not been fully recognised. In one of the many marginal notes in his own copy of Pitt's History of Staffordshire, published in 1817, Enoch says, The high compliments that were paid to Mr. Wedgwood by Dr. Aikens in his publication of 40 Miles Around Manchester in 1795, and the elegant forms which the great Dr. Darwin speaks so highly of, were executed principally by my brother William. And he also notes, and if we may have the next slide, please. He also notes, um, as one of his many marginal uh, comments in Pitt's book of 1817, uh, that uh, Pitt quoted word for word a section of, uh, from Dr. Aitken's book of 1795, his description of the country 30 to 40 miles around Manchester. And he makes the following comment in the margin of page 426. And if you could just uh, highlight that for me, Anne, that would be lovely. And he's got a little um, asterisk here. Um, 1763, and he says, um, a very, Dr. Aitken's account begins thus, um, and he goes on to say, a very erroneous account, but no one has chosen to put it right. And he goes on to say in this very long um, inscription, that Dr. Aitken had most clearly been imposed upon in a subject on which he himself could only judge from accounts which he received from persons whose interest it was to keep real facts and truth in the background and whose taste and disposition chiefly lay in collecting the works, learning and abilities of clever, learned and ingenious men and puffing off as his own, none of which he had any fair and just claim. <laughs> Mr. Wedgwood certainly was industrious and persevering and fortunate. And he concludes, and if I could just ask you to highlight again, uh, Anne, and he concludes, no doubt Dr. Aitken believed this was all correct. So, Enoch Wood um, is taking issue with what had been written by Aitken in 1795. And essentially what he was saying was that it was Josiah Wedgwood himself who was the contributor of that account of the pottery and pottery making, which Aitken himself states in his book, was supplied by a very intelligent gentleman resident on the spot. Unsurprisingly, since Wedgwood wrote this section, he is the only living potter mentioned in the text and he gets a very good write-up. Two decades later in 1817, as we can see, Mr. Pitt was still using this same text and, Wedgwood, uh, sorry, and Enoch Wood was not impressed that Wedgwood was getting all the credit for improvements to bodies and glades that he knew others had developed and hence his irritated comments. Unfortunately, no one saw e Enoch's marginal comments and complaints, not just in this book, but in other books that he owned. He was a terrible writer in the margin. None of these were seen until the late 20th and early 21st century when some of his books started to appear on the market. And in the meantime, of course, writers in the later 19th and 20th century have looked back at these early printed sources as well as Wedgwood's own letters and have drawn on them for their own work. With Enoch Wood's comments, however, we have the opinions of someone who was there at the time. And since his comments were not for publication, but for his own satisfaction, he felt free to express himself as he wished. This, combined with his interest in the history of his hometown and industry, and his notes on the recollections of aged persons who had been active potters in the mid-18th century, does indeed give us a new and contemporary perspective on Wedgwood's early career. And if I may have the last slide, please, that would be lovely. There are the two men, the two great men, who straddled the late uh, part, the second half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century. And one of them could never get over the fact that Josiah always came first. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Miranda. That was fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. I am going, yeah, it was wonderful. I am going to look through the chat and see what questions we have. Um, here's a question. Were there any barriers to entry and becoming a potter in Josiah Wedgwood's time? Were there established guilds, trade unions, or apprenticeships? Or was it just learning by trial and error? Um, it was a very well organized industry by the um, time that Josiah was born in the 1730s. The, the pottery industry in, in North Staffordshire was uh, one of the dominant industries along with coal mining. Um, and there was a well-established system of uh, apprenticeship, which was usually preceded by an informal period, as we saw with Enoch, sort of making yourself useful around the factory. Uh, you would then take on an apprenticeship. Uh, either um, a, a premium would be paid to your master to take you on, um, and it could be anything between five and seven years. And you would, in the first part of the 18th century, it was you tended to learn the whole range of um, skills with perhaps a, a concentration on one or two. Um, a lot of people would have gone from that apprenticeship simply to be a journeyman working for other people and wouldn't have gone on to be a potter, a master potter in their own right with their own factory. Um, and you could earn good wages, you know, there's a great demand for the wares. It was well regarded as a well-paid um, job. Um, to become a, a pottery manufacturer in your own right um, largely meant having good credit. You didn't need to put up the money to buy a factory. Uh, you didn't necessarily need to um, have the money for the equipment that you needed. Um, it was perfectly possible to rent a small factory, usually with the equipment that you wanted. And so, um, so long as you could get credit for that, uh, you could stay in business and long credit was quite, quite traditional. For a lot of people, it wasn't worth their while to even think about doing that. Um, because, of course, there were no limited liability companies. If you went bankrupt, you lost everything. And so for a lot of people were perfectly happy to continue being uh, journeyman potters. Um, and um, there were no guilds, there were no unions. Um, it was a fairly sort of informal arrangement until you get to the end of the 18th century, by which time you're getting really big factories. They've gone up being about 20 people at most in a factory to several hundred. And at that point, you start to find that unions uh, develop. Thank you, Miranda. Here's an interesting <laughs> question. Women seem to have been very influential in the development of the Wedgwood brand, both as patrons and customers. How early in his business career did Josiah Wedgwood recognize the importance of women and was he ahead of the game in directly targeting this market? Well, of course, we know more about Josiah Wedgwood and his business than we do of any of the other potters of the period because the records don't survive for those other firms. Um, I mean, it's quite clear that um, Josiah realised how important the female purchasers were. And I think that that quote I gave about um, uh, his wife uh, approving of the designs that he was putting into uh, production um, is as much not just an, um, her input on the design, but also what was going to appeal to, to female taste in part. Um, of course, he was also very much aware that um, female patronage was hugely important, which is why becoming potter to Her Majesty the Queen uh, gave him uh, a great kudos. And um, he was um, frequently would um, rely on what we these days call celebrity endorsement for um, some of his goods. You know, he, he talks about um, some particular vases which aren't uh, especially attractive, but if um, his brother John could get the Duchess of Devonshire to accept a gift of them, they could then call them Devonshire vases and they'd be sure to sell. Um, so he was very much aware of that whole sort of consumer culture that was arising of wealthy um, women who had got um, money to spend and um, his wares were designed to appeal to them. Um, and I think what's fascinating is you can see that in his, in his, um, in his letters and how he is de deliberately targeting them. So a very important part of his market. A lot of uh, pottery, china, jasper ware and so forth was seen as fairly frivolous stuff, so suitable for, for women to spend their money on. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, here's a quick question. Do you know if the actual bell installed in the Brick House pottery by Wedgwood has survived? 
uh, uh, no. Um, it may have gone over to Etruria. Um, but I'm sure either Catherine or Gay would be able to say better than I possibly could. But of course, um, if it was no longer useful, it was a very useful piece of metal. It could be uh, melted down and reused. So I, I don't believe it's an answer at all, sadly. When did Wedgwood start placing Potter's marks and placing his name on all of his work? When did that practice begin? What Ooh. year? About what year? I couldn't tell you which year it happens. Um, he does start marking his wares, but um, of course he didn't just sell his own wares. Um, William Greatbatch was making uh, biscuit wares, that's wares that had been fired but not decorated and glazed, for Wedgwood to uh, then finish. And of course, if you're going to have an impressed mark on the piece, that would have had to have been whilst it was still in the clay state. So a lot of his wares weren't being marked, certainly in the early years. And um, I don't know that we know exactly when he started marking them, but quite late on, he was still selling unmarked wares and indeed other potter's wares because he complained that his uh, nephew, Thomas Byerley, um, who was then working in the London um, shop, uh, was incapable of telling uh, Wedgwood's uh, creamware from the wares that uh, they had bought in from other potters to sell. Um, so clearly they weren't all being marked even as late as, as that in the 17, late 1760s, 1770s. Are there other documents from the 18th or 19th century such as these that can reveal such fascinating information about the period? The middle of the 18th century is a, is a really difficult period and that's why um, something like um, Enoch Wood's um, accumulation of documents is, is so interesting. Um, probably the, the other sort of large group of wares we have is also related to the Wedgwood family, but that's John and Thomas Wedgwood of Big House Works. Um, quite a lot of their business documents, um, accounts and so forth, and as you saw, the rent book, uh, survive and they're with us at the Potteries Museum. And they give you an insight into um, a smaller operation. But other than that, not really. Um, Josiah Wedge, uh, sorry, Enoch Wood was a great picker up of what we would these days call printed ephemera. Um, he has some in the archive that we acquired, and he also um, compiled a, a, a large scrapbook of material relating to the late 18th and early 19th century. But other than that, there is really very, very little um, that you can, you, you can go to. Almost no survivals about the pottery industry, sadly. Hmm. Here's another question. How long were potters scraping off the barley corn uh, motifs before queensware and royal pattern molds were made? Oh gosh, I don't know how long that would have taken. I mean, um, you know, the, um, don't forget the, those salt glazed uh, plates with the barley corn would have continued to sell uh, you know, well into the 1760s and early 1770s. Salt glazed stoneware was a cheap and very affordable um, type of pottery. I, I think what's interesting is that um, Aaron Wood, who is a, a modeler and mold maker supplying all these potters, has clearly got a set of barley corn molds, which he's perfectly happy to adapt uh, when a new order comes in. I don't know how long it would have taken to um, adapt them uh, for a whole dinner service. Um, but Wedgwood himself wasn't making salt glow stoneware at that point, and so he would have had no need for the barley corn pattern, but it was a, a way of, of demonstrating to the Queen what could be ordered. Was the Queen pattern exclusive to the Queen or did um, was it used for other services, for other people? Yes, I mean um, the, um, the husk service that was made for the Empress Catherine of Russia is also on Queen shape and of course it's been made right through into the 20th century yeah. but of course you're, it's a little bit of uh, celebrity endorsement, it's a little bit of branding which really Wedgwood invents. You call it Queen shape, suddenly mm -hmm. everybody's going to want it. Yeah. Going back to marking uh, the Wedgwood wares, could marking have started with the issue of Palmer copying Wedgwood's wares? Oh, you know, that's not something I'd ever considered. I, I really don't know. Um, I think at, at this period when everything we buy, everything we look at is branded, it's really hard to remember that in the 18th century, brands hardly existed. In fact, I think Wedgwood virtually invents branding. Um, people, when they're writing um, to order uh, wares, they want them in the, the latest taste and the a neat and genteel taste and so forth. They're not too worried about exactly who's made them, which is why uh, you find that, um, archaeologically speaking, the same shapes and designs turn up on, on many different pottery sites. 
And that was why potters could, in fact, buy in goods from others and, and, and sell them as, as their own um, because they weren't branded with a back stamp. Um, I think once you get into the very expensive ornamental wares, then there is a change, yes. But um, ooh, I've never even thought about the fact that it was to distinguish his wares from Palmer's. I go back and have a think about that one. Thank you. Good question. Miranda, that is, uh, nope, question just came in. We'll take that as the last question. Okay. Um, contemporary accounts of the building of the Wedgwood Institute recount that a part of the brick house pottery was, preser was per uh, preserved in the building. Do you know what part? No, I don't. Um, what you have to sort of remember in the 19th century is that there was, although they, put the um, Wedgwood Memorial Institute on top of the Brickhouse works, it was to honour Wedgwood um, and his memory and his, his goods, the wares he'd produced. There was no sense of preserving the factory as we would perhaps wish to do so these days. By the middle of the 19th century, it was a rundown and, and really rather decrepit building. I, I, can own, I can't imagine that part of the Brickhouse was actually built into the, the main structure of what is quite a large and impressive building. Um, I, I would ask Abe Blake Roberts, who's done quite a lot of research into the Wedgwood Institute, if, if she, she knows of that. But I, I, don't, I don't know the answer myself. Thank you, Miranda. That's our last Pleasure. question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for a fascinating and wonderful lecture. It was just so, so interesting. Oh. Um, and I, oh, and I we see. see a, yeah, we see Katrin uh, Jones has responded to the marking. Oh, oh, thank question. you for that, Catherine. I knew you would know. <laughs> yeah, if everyone um, checks their chat, they'll see uh, Catherine's message. But for now, I'm going to turn it back over to Lorraine. Thank you, Anne. Uh, first, Miranda, thank you so much. This was absolutely spellbinding. Um, it's to your credit that we had 143 participants today. Oh, fantastic. So fantastic. I think you deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Well, thank, um, thank you. Thank you all for turning up. <laughs> it was terrific. Um, I really want to thank all of you who did turn up today and wanted to listen in. Um, our next lecture on Zoom will be held again on Friday at 2.30, same time, same station, uh, on the 18th of February. It will again, like I said, be at 2.30 in the US on the East Coast, 7.30 in the UK. And our speaker will again be Robin Emerson. Robin is currently an independent consultant after having been the curator of decorative art department at National Museums in Liverpool. And some of you may remember that Robin uh, was trying so hard to give what was a wonderful lecture in November and there was a technical issue with his um, internet. So he has very graciously agreed to visit with us again on the 18th of February. Specific information about that lecture um, will um, be sent out to all members in an email. We will have it on our Facebook page. We will have the information again on our very new and, as I said, vastly improved website and you will find everything you need, including the seminar information on the new website. The link for the next Zoom lecture will be the same as the link for today's lecture. And thank you all of you again for joining us today. I hope you all stay safe and stay well, and please wear your masks. So see you all on February 18th. Bye now. Thank you very much. Thank you.